There are two main reactive systems, subsumption architecture, which is layers of behaviors and their control relationships, and the potential fields method as another example of schema theory, where concurrent behaviors with a perceptual and a motor schema work to navigate. Both of these systems are equivalent in power, and sometimes there's a mixture of the layers and the concurrency for a reactive system. Subsumption architecture is a form of reactive control developed by Rodney Brooks in 1985. Subsumption architecture builds systems incrementally from simple parts to more complex parts. The complex parts use the simple existing components as much as possible. The layers are added from the bottom up with the bottom layer being zero and the most simple. The most complex layer is at the top. The inputs of a layer or modules may be inhibited so that it receives no sensory inputs. It will compute no reaction and send no output to effectors or other modules. There is also substitution or subsumption, which substitutes input going into a module for something else. The output of a layer or module may be suppressed so that it receives sensory inputs but performs no computation and cannot control any effectors or other modules. Or it turns off output from a module. Representation and summary. Higher la layers can assume the existence of lower ones and the goal they are achieving or use the lower ones to achieve their own goals. Higher layers can subsume lower ones by using them while they are running or by suppressing them selectively. The controller is a bottom-up approach because it progresses from simpler to more complex as layers are added incrementally. This architecture should be taskable and accomplished by a higher level turning lower levels on and off. In subsumption architecture, the world is its own best model, as is in all of reactive control. If the world can provide the information directly through sensing, it is best rather than to store it internally. Components are task achieving actions or behaviors. The lower levels handle the most basic tasks like moving. The higher levels exploit the existing ones, such as obstacle avoidance or wall following. The goal is to have very few connections between the different layers. The only intended connections are inhibition and suppression, and there are strongly con coupled connections within the layers and loosely coupled connections between the layers. Potential fields. The motor schema can be expressed with potential fields methodology. A potential field can be constructed from primitives summed together. The behavior outputs are combined using vector summation. The robot feels a vector or force from each behavior, the magnitude and the direction. Every point in space represents a force as a field that would feel at that point. For example, robot run away via potential fields would look like this. When the robot's far enough away, it's in the gray area and it does not feel the vector. However, when it gets within the zone, the robot will begin to roll away because it now can detect the obstacle. And then once again, once it's far enough away, it doesn't perceive the obstacle. Here are some examples of primitive potential fields. One of them is uniform, which moves in a particular direction and would be used for wall following. Another one is run away, which would be used for obstacle avoidance, which we saw on the prior slide. Attraction could be used for move to goal or to move a robot to a certain point in the world. Tangital could be used to move the robot through a door or for docking. And random could be used for potential fields such as when a robot is in a stuck situation in order to get it out. Here's another example of using potential fields for robot navigation. If the robot starts at the location, this is the path that it takes. The robot only fills the vector at the current location and then it moves. The robot never computes the field of vectors, only fills for the local vector in order in this case to move to goal while also avoiding an obstacle. For follow sidewalk, here's an example of how to use potential fields. The robot would model the sides as attractors in order to move the robot to the sidewalk. And then once it's in the center of the sidewalk, you model the center as a forward uniform flow in order to keep the robot on the sidewalk. Finally, here's an example of how to use potential fields in order to dock a robot. It is similar to the technique that we used for following a sidewalk. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages to this method? Potential fields are very easy to visualize, so that's one of the advantages. It's easy to build up software libraries and fields can be parameterized. 
and combining mechanisms are fixed and tweaked with gains. However, some of the disadvantages are, is it the local minima problem if the vector sum to zero and the robot gets stuck? There's jerky motion, and unfortunately, this method is only good for mobile robot navigation, unlike subsumption architecture, which can be used for other types of tasks as well. This concludes today's lecture on reactive control. Have an awesome robotastic day.